Welcome to the Bonnie Forward Show. I'm your host, Bonnie Forward. And today I have the pleasure of introducing Miss Kim Carath from, most of you will remember, The Sound of Music as the littlest Von Trapp child, Gretel. Hello, Kim Carath. Welcome. <laughs> Hi there, Bonnie. It's nice to see you and be able to talk to you. It's great to see you too. So let's jump right on in. By the time you were five years old, you were cast in the five-time Academy Award winning film, The Sound of Music, which also Academy Award winning for Best Picture and Best Director. You were the youngest of the seven Von Trapp children, but before that, you'd already played the on-screen daughter of Henry Fonda, Maureen O'Hara, Jack Lemon, and Doris Day. <laughs> That's quite a resume for a five-year-old. Yeah, I, I was not a slacker. <laughs> you were obviously really going for it. You wanted that Oscar by the time you were six. Any <laughs> or, my, or my mother did. <laughs> I want to ask you, what was that transition like from being a child or did you have other siblings in the other movies i did i did in my first experience with a vast number of siblings was in uh, my first movie spencer's mountain because when i was henry fonda and maureen o'hara's child mm -hmm. patty cake mm -hmm. quite a name patty. and um i had many siblings among them actually was veronica cartwright who's Angela Cartwright's right. sister. Mm -hmm. So I've been part of, I was part of that family twice. I nice. had two Cartwright sisters and, um, and James MacArthur was the older brother, which was very familiar to me because I had an older brother around that age and an older sister. So mm -hmm. that was my first experience with a number of um, siblings. And the second movie, I had one sibling who was Brian Nash, really great kid actor and a wonderful man. Um, so, and then Good Neighbor Sam, I actually don't remember. I think I had one sibling, but Sound of Music was my, those were the siblings that I got to know, like a second family could, because it took a year altogether to film the movie, you know, film and post and everything and rehearsals. So we, we did become a second family. Well, and there were seven of them, of you. Six of I mean, us, right. Six, seven of six, us all together. Six more of Depends you. Depends on how you count it. Yeah, yeah, right. There were seven in total. So you had six siblings on that. So that's, uh, so I just love this. Oh, and for those of you who don't know, James MacArthur is the son of Helen Hayes, which a lot of people don't know that. I, and I, most people also do know that I went out with him very briefly a billion years later. <gasps> Ooh, and um spicy. A to total sweetheart oh my gosh what a really nice guy it was after i think it was after hawaii 50 and he was doing front page mm -hmm. the play front page mm -hmm. in pa at a theater in palo alto and i'd gone with one of my marlboro girlfriends we uh -huh. bonnie and i you and i both have that in common our marlboro past anyway and then we went backstage and i saw him and he was so thrilled to see me and then we we went out you know, briefly, and he was a doll. Oh, that's great. What a spicy little saucy story. He was a good kisser, so. Oh, you know. <laughs> yeah. we like to hear that. Nothing like, nothing better than a great kisser. No, no, there's, it can go no further if there's not a great kissing. I totally you know, agree. involved. I absolutely 100% agree with you, my Yeah, it's, it's, it foretells the future very It does indeed. Clearly. Yeah. does indeed so tell our viewers what song you sang for your audition for sound of music yes well again because i had an older brother who was 16 years older than i was and a sister that was that is 15 years older than i am i was five going on 16 at least so when they asked me what song i'd like to sing from the movie I said, I'd like to sing 16 going on 17, which must have been <laughs> kind of funny for them to see a five-year-old singing that song, but I got the part, so it must not have been too ludicrous. 
I can just picture you. I can just picture you. Um, <laughs> with your little face, <laughs> your little round face. I am thinking going on. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I was super like mature for my age under, uh, you know, understandably. So I, I really did think that I was older. <laughs> which is what made it so convincing, which is why you got cast in the I guess, I guess. <laughs> Do you know how many other Gretels you were up against? Do you oh, know hundreds, hundred, at least hundreds and hundreds. So uh, the, it was a vast casting going on. I mean, I was not in a room with hundreds of Gretels, but you know. Of course not, you were, you know, there were probably 30 or 40 in the waiting room as you sat there waiting for your turn to go into the I don't room. remember. You know, I, I really don't, I don't, don't remember that many. It wasn't like a mass casting, mm -hmm. you know, at that point for me, cause I, I had a whole past resume. history. Well, you had a yeah. resume. So. I had a resume. Yeah. There you go. So they, you were already, I think, getting to that hole in one when you got in there. That's all. Well, you know, <laughs> they, they supposedly did not really want to cast me cause I was only five mm -hmm. and they're uh, up, at, up at that time i mean now there's a billion more restrictions but we at least had a few back in the day and you couldn't have a five-year-old work or a, someone under six work as long hours as long of hours as you could someone over six so it was a vast celebration on the set when i turned six vast how far into the shooting was your birthday <sighs> I'm, I'm an august birthday so and i i you started I'm shooting in early person. spring that much i do know I know that you guys started, but we had done, we had done a lot of rehearsal before then, you mm -hmm. know, and we did get to Salzburg. We should have had better weather though. It's a long story. We should have had a lot better weather than we had in Salzburg. That's part of the reason that it took a while longer instead of a six week location shoot. It was a three month location shoot. Yeah, well, he was, you know, Robert Wise, your brilliant director, had just come off his best director and best picture wins for West Side Story in 1961, which is huge, when he began shooting all of you guys in The Sound of Music in early spring of 1964. So what was it like working with him, especially given the your weather constraint stuff? Well, you know, first of all, he was a sweetheart. He's a really lovely, kind, very patient man who mm -hmm. spoke to us very respectfully, especially, you know, the, when it comes to like small children, he made a lot of effort to communicate really on our level. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think he really was patient. I don't remember his ever being angry um, or impatient with people. In fact, he would nap sometimes, you know, in, set everything up and then kind of nap while they were finishing setting up very, relaxed, calm, meticulous person. Mm -hmm. You know, my only negative experience was when he decided that the scene that they'd set up with using my double um, who could swim, he decided at the last minute that it would look a lot better with using me, which was the rowboat scene who did yeah, not swim. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. But, uh, so that's my only, the only okay. objection I have to anything that he ever did was in his obvious quest for, in his obvious perfectionism and desire to have things be just as wonderfully perfect cinematically as they could be, he decided that it would be better to have me in that scene versus the, the my double who looked not, I mean, enough like me so that at a far distance, you might, you know, just make a, you might think doggy, doggy barking. I don't. I apologize. No problem. She, she never, she never comes in when I'm doing a show, but she snuck in. She's just a that's, little teeny tiny cute. thing. So no, sorry but about I, that. I she think had a she, comment I, to me. No problem. I, I, she didn't like that either. That She's like, what? Exactly. <laughs> what? Put like a little kid at risk versus. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, it was actually pretty traumatic for Julie because, you know, at the last minute, well, let me go well, back. Tell, yeah, tell so, us the story of what happened. The, the story what happened. basically was that last minute he decided it would be better if I was in the shot. 
So he went to my mother and said, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and my mother said, ask Kimmy. So that's what everybody used to call me back then. And, and asking like a five-year-old or if I turned six, I don't know, maybe I'd turned six by then, whether, you know, she was going to be at risk is probably not the most optimal thing. You know, I mean, obviously I was a team player. I wouldn't have done four movies. Right. Kid actors need to be particularly flexible and eager to please, um, which I was, all of that. Um, so I think, you know, he said something to me about they really needed me and, you know, it, it was, we were a team and they'd keep me safe. And of course I said yes, because no matter how scared I was, I would have said yes in those circumstances. And I almost drowned because, you know, well, first of all, poor Julie, they said to her, which traumatized her, by the way, he said to her before they started shooting, they'll make sure you catch the little one because she can't swim. Oh. And um, poor thing. So first time we did it, she did catch me, mm -hmm. but he didn't like that take. So unfortunately, after we dried off, we did that take again. And if you watch the movie carefully, you can see the expression of abject terror in my face right before the boat capsizes. Mm -hmm. And um, that time I, I went off, she went off the other side, I went under and down to the bottom of the lake. And they had an AD ready to jump in should there be a problem. And he did jump in and I was saved because I'm here. So, <laughs> so that's good. But um, it's, it wasn't smart. You yeah. know, it was a poor choice. And I must say that when I saw the tragedy that happened on the Alec Baldwin shoot, it did come back to me very much mm -hmm. at that point about how easily things can go wrong and how many precautions should always be in place. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, it's a movie and you, you don't want to have loss of life. Oh, no, a movie. never, 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 never. Always reminds me of Vic Morrow and those children. Absolutely. Just horrible. Absolutely. Um, horrible. You know. So um, it could have been a tragedy. And, and it actually may still have been one because um, Heather, people die of something called secondary drowning because they swallow a lot of water and it ends up collude, you know, occluding their lungs mm -hmm. overnight. Mm -hmm. And um because obviously we never went to an emergency room or you don't even know what they would have had at Salzburg at that particular point right. in time in 1964. But um, Heather was so, Heather Menzies became a very, very close friend throughout my life. She played Louisa. Uh -huh. And in the next cut, which there's a jump cut after it's Louisa holding me. And she had been, I had been crying so much and she'd been holding me so tightly so to hugging me to to comfort me that i ended up vomiting like vast quantities of lake water unfortunately <laughs> on heather which is one of the many <laughs> reasons we're bonded for life but um she may have saved me from secondary drowning and i, I was lucky enough to be able to tell her that many years later when i found out about it i'm like what would have happened exactly. you know i don't know you you, you Nobody was took me to a doctor right after that. Nobody was going to, you and know, no I was medics, just going to. No medics yeah. on set. Yeah. And nobody, nobody knew about that back then. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think Heather saved my life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, love, love conquers all. Love saves everybody. It does. I wish I could have saved her. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, I do remember in the film, though, when the boat capsizes, we do see you come off but we don't see you come back <laughs> because that was the right exactly they they had to stop and <laughs> alan callow the ad jumped in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from shore mm -hmm. got me there's yeah. there are pictures of me sobbing you know in alan callow's arms as he like you know carried me well the off. amount of fear the amount of fear that you experienced is just yeah, yeah. but you guys went right on filming we so. went right on we the right show on. must go on. No. <laughs> so, yeah. Did you guys, I have a question. Was the film shot in sequence or out of sequence? In other words, was the end scene out, in the auditorium? Out of, out of, 
out of sequence. Out of sequence. That's a lot of work for the editor. Whew. Um, because it's just, you know, so did you have, did you do a wrap party after everything was done? We did. We had a couple of them. We had one in Salzburg, the big one. No, we didn't have one in Salzburg. Oh, okay. We, we, cause that wasn't really the end. There was more to do, okay. but, um, because we started with the interiors and I'm not, then we did salts. We did rehearsals, right. the interiors, right? Uh, but I'm not sure we did all of the interiors. We went to Salzburg, we came back and I think we wrapped up at that point. And then we had a party. We had at least one party at Julie Andrews mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. house, a swimming, but ironically swimming party, of course, but then I went nowhere near swimming pools. <laughs> you know, I can tell you even when, when I, I mean, I tried to conquer that fear and I eventually Marlboro made me learn how to swim. Me and yeah. Laura Roden, this other friend yeah. of mine at Marlboro uh -huh. were, you know, were just not good swimmers. And they, we, they made a special class for us to, you know, they just took the pool. That was our okay. pool That's to learn. Great. That was very good of Marlboro. That was great. I'm, so I, I can swim. I'm not good and I don't want to be near the water, but I, I can say I could save but myself. At least you can dog paddle. Right. <laughs> did you uh at what the last scene you guys did in the auditorium, um, the outdoor amphitheater, whatever you want to call it, um, what at what point in the film was that shot, do you think? I can, I couldn't I couldn't tell you. I mean, were you five or six? Well, we were in Austria, so however old I was by the time we got to Austria. But you said you stayed in Austria for three months. Yeah. So you probably had your. But birthday I did there. not have my birthday in Austria. My birthday was at the Fox Lot. Okay. All so right. since my birthday's in August, my guess is we were home by then. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, that makes sense then. Okay. Um, so did you go to the Oscars the year that uh, you won? Sound of Music won. No, isn't that sad? I Why? would have loved to have done that. Although you know what, I didn't know because they didn't invite the kids. You're kidding me. No. Oh my goodness. And then isn't little, that, Jude, isn't that little Jude sad? Hill from Belfast, he was invited this year. Little Jude Hill that played well, uh, uh, Kenneth uh, Bronner's part. Well, I mean, he, he was, well, it's, you're, it's a good point. I mean, you're making was, a good point. He just turned 11. I mean, you know, he was nine when they shot the film. Oh, yeah. So he's just, and he just. Oh, how yeah. good. Let me just oh. say this. How unbelievably good was he? He was fabulous. And he I was, absolutely adored absolutely that movie. Fabulous. That I movie was just a masterpiece. I agree with you. I agree with you. Kenneth Bronner to go back into his life like that. Oh my goodness. That was just. It was so beautifully written. So um, heartbreaking, funny, just amazing. I, you know, laughed, cried the whole, the whole thing. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you know, it was his life story. I know. And yeah. he really brought it to the screen brilliantly. I, I just, you know, I, I, everybody, I was always a big fan, huger fan now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Me too. Me too. He deserved every, he just deserved every, I mean, he was just, yeah, I am, you know, and, and, totally and not to, you know, go into all of this, but Coda was oh, un okay. unbelievable. I lost it in Coda. I just was just sobbing. Sobbing. I, I okay. <laughs> It was so touching. It was so incredible. No kidding. There, I started watching it full face of makeup, all done. Just I'd been out running around that day. By the time I finished the movie, it was as though I had washed my face. My yeah. makeup wasn't smeared. Yeah. It was off. Yeah. Yeah. It was like I cried yeah. so hard. Uh -huh. It was totally cleansed, basically. So it was so beautiful. And and obviously being a special needs parent, which I am. Mm -hmm. Um, it just was all that much oh, more. All the as my daughter would say, all the feels. It had oh, all the feels. Brilliant. You know, brilliant. it really was. I mean, whoa. I mean, I was surprised that it wasn't released in a theater. I mean, I really was. I'm just saying. Well, it I mean certainly it certainly deserved to be it, it absolutely bigger than just a streaming platform, you know. But oh yeah. Well, eventually, I mean, you know, eventually it was, right? So, but really so affecting that one particular scene that just i had to stop you know we were watching it i had to stop and, and go sob some more in the bathroom 
trying to not alarm everybody in the house. <laughs> so loud. When when the the father says sing for me. Yeah, and puts his and yeah. oh my God, puts his yeah. hands on yeah. her. Because yeah. when I sing when I yeah. when I sing for my son, who is primarily nonverbal, he loves to feel how the words are formed. So he puts his fingers on my lips a lot of the time, mm -hmm. which makes it hard to sing well, but it's not the point. And he, it just was like so true, so amazingly that, that what it takes to communicate past a barrier of handicap is mammoth. Yeah. Well, especially in the case of death. I mean, she, her whole life was was oral audio you know yeah. and their life was completely not it was a beautiful film and for that i mean i just you know i mean for you it's a particularly you know given oh that once the, the hands know, went on the thing i just was gone you know oh and then his expression as she's singing oh, oh what my a brilliant God. brilliant brilliant <laughs> acting brilliant every single moment was done so sensitively and so perfectly. I'm just like massive fan of the sensibility. Troy, Troy Cotter totally that. deserved it. Totally. totally deserved totally. that Oscar. I mean, he was phenomenal as the father. Totally. Phenomenal. I mean, it was just yeah. the whole, the whole group. And did you know that, um, that, uh, uh, Emily, is it Emily? Em Emmy? Oh God, I've forgotten the, the daughter. That the, right. speaking, the speaking daughter, she, um, her last name is Jones. She learned sign language for that film. Oh, she, of course. Not only was she British about, and the American accent was so perfect, but she also had to come, she took a year to learn. Yeah, of course. Sign language. I mean, that all those things that she had going on to play yeah. that part, I was shocked that she wasn't a yeah. monster, but that that's just- Yeah, me too, me too, me too, me too. Yeah. That seemed to me to be the, I mean, that was, you know, I mean, that was a 10 out of 10 uh, for me. I mean, yeah. as far as somebody who should have been nominated, I, I just, I, I don't understand the account. Maybe, yeah. maybe because it was a streaming platform once again, a lot of times this happens, I don't know, but it seemed as though Coda bef right up until practically right up until the Oscars was overlooked for a long Very long much, long. very much so. I thought so too. And it seemed like they're getting thrown into the best picture was sort of a last minute decision almost. It was like, wow, I guess we can't, you know, not do that because everybody's loving it. So, you know, let's put it in there with the best picture. I mean, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but there was, you know, a couple of films in the best picture category that I thought could have not been there. I didn't see every single film, so I can't, you know, I can't say I saw most of them. Yeah, I saw, well, I saw them all, but I didn't, and I didn't, but whatever. Um, but speaking of the Oscars, and at the risk of beating an already dead horse. That's well, let me just jump in for one second. Sure. I actually thought King Richard was brilliant. And I thought Will Smith was brilliant and completely deserved that Academy Award. That he was. That was Washington. Oh, no, King Richard. What am I talking about? I'm, no, I, I'm Richard, talking I'm about, yeah, Shakespeare. I'm talking about Will, Will Smith and King Richard. I That's thought he was it. brilliant. He was. I thought the movie was astonishing. You know, I thought everybody did a spectacularly good job. I didn't think I'd be that interested because I'm not a big sports person. I was spellbound from the beginning and I thought it was brilliant. And he absolutely deserved that Oscar. So, oh, 100%. 100%. He captured. Uh, Richard Williams in a way that I mean, Richard Williams is a quirky guy, you know, he's a he's a quirky guy. And in a very particular way, I don't know, you, you're not a sports person. But do you watch Wimbledon? Do you ever watch Wimbledon? Um, Once in a while, when well, you people, might remember when, pe when, pe when people force me to. <laughs> well, see, I'm I'm a huge tennis fan. So I don't play it, but I love it. Um, but he was thrown out of Wimbledon because he was shouting at the at his daughters when they would play because they would each play, of course, separately. Um, and the the people were like, 
get him out. He's got to go because he's, he's in this special box and he's like, and he's at Wimbledon. It's like he's going, ah, you know, and they were just so got to go, got to go. And he's like, no, you can't take me. I so the whole thing was filmed. It was, it was, you know, you, as it, as it, you could see. And then you know, they cut back to the box and he wasn't there. So, um, yeah. So he was, like I say, he was a quirky guy. He was very laser focused on those girls and full of love. And he loved his daughters. No question about it. And Will Smith captured that brilliantly. Brilliant. That it's, it's hard to capture a quirky person. That's a real person that's living. Totally. You know what I mean? That's tough oh, yeah. to do, you know? Oh, yeah. um, he, he inhabited it. He breathed it. It was clear. You know, he felt everything. Hundred percent, and it was it was good. You felt that ferocity of protectiveness. You felt that laser focus, all of it. And I knew nothing about the story. I came to it. You know, I mean, obviously, I knew about Serena and Venus, but not not the real backstory. Mm -hmm. So, um, what do you think has happened with the uh, comedy and the Oscars? Well, as we, you know, as we've discussed on Facebook, because we are Facebook friends, um, you know, uh, assault is assault. I don't ever think anybody should be hit, slapped, anything, mm -hmm. um, unless they are attacking you physically. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Um, I think people deserve to be safe in their place of work. Mm -hmm. which it certainly was. I, it was, you know, we were watching the Oscars. My son with all his special needs loves award shows. He's so cute because there's music and there's all kinds of, there are all kinds of things going on. So he and I were dancing around watching the Oscars, dancing to the music, you know, having a blast basically uh -huh. completely uh -huh. relaxed and basically mm -hmm. so enjoying people being, applauded for all their incredibly hard work and everything it takes to get to that level of achievement. Mm -hmm. When, when that happened, I mean, we were, I was, well, Eric was still okay, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I was just nauseated. I was so disturbed. I had like a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach because I couldn't believe first I thought it was the stage. Then it was like, Oh my God, this is real. And then I was actually really incredulous that everything went on as though nothing had happened. Um, I could see everybody's expressions of discomfort. You couldn't even hear anymore. I couldn't hear summer of soul acceptance speech, which I think came right next to it. Yes. I saw the great job uh, Chris Rock did being graceful and gracious and everything. But I actually, for myself too, had just like a terrible feeling of distress. And, um, you know, it, it did eclipse everything that happened later because it was very shocking, very shocking. So, you know, and I, I did analyze it in, in the immediate time of it, which was the, the joke. Mm -hmm. which was in and of itself really inoffensive, in my opinion, since G.I. Jane, the movie that Demi Moore did, she looked absolutely beautiful and Jada Pinkett looked absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. So it was just like a choice of hair as far as I could see. Mm -hmm. um, Will Smith laughed first. Absolutely. And then I happened to notice Jada Pinkett Smith's face looked like I did. it had turned to stone. Exactly. Exactly. And then there was whatever little exchange and then there was what happened. So, I mean, obviously I thought it was a horrible thing. And I, I got his acceptance, Will Smith's acceptance speech for an award that he absolutely deserved was a, was a terrible acceptance speech because it was all about him and it was, it felt manipulated. It didn't feel correct. It didn't have the apology. Mm -hmm. I mean, I felt bad for him, but yeah, I, felt I, felt I felt way felt worse, yeah, I way felt worse for Chris Rock, yeah, way worse for Chris Rock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so obviously since in all the discussions people were having, you know, which became frankly ridiculous mm -hmm. as a lot of discussions become now when mm -hmm. people are polarized and looking for any excuse to 
behave in a kind of whiny way Mm -hmm. for lack of a better description. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, It was, I mean, I found myself shocked hearing anybody defending it because, you know, nobody could be slapped if you worked at Pizza Hut. Mm -hmm. You couldn't have a slap if -hmm. you worked behind the counter at Pizza Hut or at Burger King or at your local market. Mm -hmm. One person could not slap another. Two employees or however you want to look at it. (laughs) It's called an assault. Right. There would be police involved. There would be holding. You can't just do that. And then it's okay. It's not okay no matter what. So it's, it's, and no matter what your reasons are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me specifically, it became a bit of an issue because first of all, I had friends who've been assaulted, who were so upset because they were, had been so triggered. Mm -hmm. I have one particular friend who had been completely attacked by, by his boyfriend Mm -hmm. and it was out of the blue and he almost died. And thank goodness a policeman came right, right away. Mm -hmm. But I've had other friends who just, people were triggered Mm -hmm. and that was horrible to see. Then the argument started. Then people started likening alopecia to, to handicaps, to disabilities. Yeah. And for me, that is a trigger because I, live in a world with a disabled child. Mm -hmm. I have started a foundation, co-founded a foundation that creates programs for disabled young adults. Mm -hmm. I am in this world of Mm -hmm. actual disabilities. Mm -hmm. So hair, sorry, it's not a disability. Yeah, sorry, not sorry. Or as my husband says, who has a son with CP, Mm -hmm. who's in a wheelchair, Mm If we could put a wig on Dylan and have him walk, yeah, you know, if only, because my comment kind of is and and was and continues to be, it's hair, right? Wear a wig, don't wear a wig, exactly. You know, own it, don't own it. We all have options. I mean, Um, don't doesn't most of Hollywood get it at some point? Well, you know, look, as I talked to my hairdresser about it, I who was just apoplectic as well. He said. Who wasn't wearing a wig in the audience? Listen, if you're not wearing a full wig, it's extra hair, hair extensions, exactly. et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. It's, it's hair's a choice. Exactly. I mean, it's not a choice to lose it, obviously, but then we live in, in we've lived in societies that have had wigs for, starting from the Egyptians, yeah. let alone the things that people have now. Mm-hmm. Um, it just seems awfully entitled and privileged to, to call anything to do with hair, a disability. Yeah. It's not pleasant. It's, it's disturbing. It's many things, but we have remedies. Yeah. You know, we have yeah. ways around it. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and, you know, also in my discussions with people too, was like, I'm sorry, you know, I had it at one point. Mm-hmm. I had it when my mother died. She mm-hmm. died horribly of pancreatic cancer. Mm-hmm. I had already lost my dad it was just, it was, it was really a bad time. My hair, just like handfuls of hair. Mm -hmm. And, you know, eventually it settled down, but I, I mean, I, at no point did I compare that to the fact that my son has brain damage. Yeah, I know. know, Exactly. And then it, you know, spirals into this whole thing of, you know, uh, well, you, you don't understand because it's a black women's hair thing. And it's, a, it's not a black, white, Asian, whatever person. Most, uh, most, Everybody of gets Hollywood's, it. most of Hollywood's women from the golden age mm-hmm. by golden age, we mean golden age, right? Right. We're, we're, we're bald by mm-hmm. the time, you know, by the time they were 30, 40 mm-hmm. from the kind of hair dyes that were used on their hair. Yeah, exactly. Debbie Reynolds. Mm-hmm. I mean, a very good friend of mine whose mother was a, an, an actress from that era, same thing. I'm not going to, you know, tell tales for people who don't want to talk about it, right. but Marilyn Monroe, Sydney Gileroff, I don't think Marilyn was quite yet, but they were a lot, they had a lot of right. wigs on her. But Lana Turner actually said it in her autobiography. Mm-hmm. She said, My, I needed wigs at the, at, you know, she also needed eyebrows. They right. put a little eyebrow wig on her because they had plucked everything so much mm-hmm. that there was nothing left. I mean, and these women were 
were gorgeous. They were spectacular. So what? You do your eyebrows, you do your, you, it's, it's not life or death. Mm -hmm. I normally don't agree with Bill Maher. So for me to, to agree with Bill Maher as I have lately, mm -hmm. I don't know what's happening. You know, he said it's alopecia, not leukemia. Exactly. exactly. And, and had it been that God forbid Jada Pinkett Smith had been, had had cancer and lost her hair that way, it would have been horribly horrible for him to make that joke if he knew that. First of all, I don't think he knew she had alopecia. No, he didn't. I don't he think didn't. they knew. No, he didn't. And, no. and second of all, people do make that choice. Sinead mm -hmm. O'Connor used to wear her hair like that. Absolutely. That was a choice. Yeah, exactly. There are lots of fashion choices that we make. And, you know, honestly, people joke about everything. It's mm -hmm. not that big of a deal. You got to well, have a and, sense of humor you know, as well. The, the, and the jokes that, you know, every, that, 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 Chris told were completely off the cuff and improv because the jokes that were vetted, uh, he didn't even have a chance to get to because this happened. And I, I heard uh, Lorna Luft say the other day that uh, uh, the uh, that one of the producers of the Oscars said that after Will Smith slapped Chris Rock and everyone realized it wasn't a bit um, after Smith got back to his seat and started shouting obscenities and all that kind of stuff, that it was as if cement had been poured into the room. I'm sure you could feel it, but you really could feel it in people's faces. Everybody was t completely nonplussed. And, you know, the other part of that is so you weird. can't take people's, and by the way, the, there was a beautiful apology that, that Will Smith made, you know, the last one that was wonderful about having taken people's, he apologizing for also yes. for taking people's, the attention away from other people. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but but the other part of that is like, I was reading, I don't know Chris Rock, I've never met him, but he has a childhood that was marked by bullying. Oh yeah, oh absolutely. So, so let's talk about what a kind of a trigger, I mean, it's not in my business to talk about it, but since we are, what a trigger that had to be for absolutely. someone who'd been bullied as a smaller man, physically as a small child, yeah. smaller than his peers, yeah. you know, for someone who had a childhood of being bullied. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a childhood of being bullied mm -hmm. and, and I mean, maybe that's a, another reason for me, that kind of behavior triggered me, mm -hmm. uh, myself as well. Um, but after I did sound of music and I went to elementary school and then I would come out of elementary school, you know, to go film other things. Cause I did a lot of TV throughout all those years. Mm -hmm. There was, I don't know, a lot of bullying, jealousy, bullying. Oh, the hills are alive, blah, blah. Just, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of stuff. And I was a super sensitive kid, which made it worse mm -hmm. because if I had been like kind of a bullyish kid back, it wouldn't have been, you know, that bothersome, but it was horrible. And thankfully, after I graduated from uh, elementary school, I went to Marlboro mm -hmm. and Marlboro had a zero tolerance oh yeah policy yeah. Oh, yeah. of bullying oh, yeah. oh yeah zero oh, i had no problem once i went there it was right. all about intellectual achievement and right. having manners and being yeah. decent to one another and thank god for that mm -hmm. but i mean i i'm sorry i my sympathies went to chris rock absolutely 100 percent. yeah lorna loft and i went to elementary school together and let me tell you, the bullying that she endured was ridiculous. I mean, it's like, it I'm sure, a, you know, it was because she was the daughter of Judy Garland. So it was all, right. you know, you think you're so big, you know, that, that kind of stuff people, you know, the kids would say, and it, Poor was, thing. it was awful. It was awful. Poor thing. You know, it's, man. it's terrible. It's intolerable. But again, I'm, I'm immensely grateful to our school yeah. for having stopped that so completely. Yeah. Well, it was all girls school too, which makes the dynamics a little it bit helped. different too, which helps a lot, you know. I think. But um, administration had, was just not going to put up with it as, no. as the, as it should never have been put up with. Yeah, no. And, you know, I mean, even if it was a little on the aside, you know, word got around and people would, you know, the girls would stand up for each other, which was nice, you know? You know oh, they, totally, totally. Yeah. And it was, it, but it was so light. Oh my God. It was, it was like a war zone in elementary school. Oh, and of course. Um, unfortunately, you know, I was fortunately 
I'm super smart. And, and they, I was gifted. So they kept taking me out to bring me to special classes. And then they kept skipping me grades, which was actually good. So I kind of eventually skipped past the people who were bullying me. Right. Um, but the, the bad part of that was that, you know, I was also like, quote, teacher's pet. So it'd be like, everybody did badly on this except for Kim. <laughs> not only that, I was not- not only really that I'm nearsighted and my vision wasn't correct right not my vision wasn't corrected yet so I wasn't great at all the games that involved balls oh, curling Kim. coming near me poor Kim and oh, I was asthmatic so oh, let's see, asthmatic nearsighted gifted actress blah 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 like put it just put a gigantic target yeah so oh, I, I thank God Kim. for Marlboro pretty much every day Poor Kim. Oh it was not God. pretty. No, that is that's not a good look. Speaking of looks, let's talk about skin and keeping and staying as beautiful as you are. What's your new skincare routine? I know you're not endorsing any particular products. I'm not. Day. I'm not because nobody's paying me. But if you did pay- post if- the other day about something that you're using on your skin, and it's just too fabulous not to well, talk about. Well, I had day. to share because somebody asked me. So if somebody asks me, I tell them. Of course. I, as as many people will attest to that. That's like why we love and then you. they'll get they'll get more than they bargained for in the description. <laughs> why we love I'm, you. I'm pretty passionate about skincare. You know, I think it makes a big difference as oh, we yeah. get older. Oh, huge. Yeah. And um and because I'm I I don't want to have anything very intrusive done because I, I really don't want to die having plastic surgery and leave my disabled child behind and have died over, over vanity. So I will be as, as vigilant about skincare and I'll try everything that exists that is not invasive and does not involve general anesthesia and someone cutting me open and putting my life at risk. So Mm -hmm. apropos of that. So I've completely fallen in love with, um, um, TNS serum. It's, it's a, um, especially their advanced serum. The brand is, I'm writing this down. God, what's the brand? Is it skin suit? You know what I'm, can I just go get a, go Please. get it and show you. Okay. Yeah. Let me, let me just get the thing. The advanced serum, right? Okay. Skin Medica. That's it. The okay. brand, the brand is Skin Medica. Okay. And um, I get have it tried. You get it Lots of places have it. I, you can get it online, the skin store, you know, a lot of oh, okay. or or okay. TN or uh, Skin Medica itself, the Skin Medica site. Okay. Okay. But I had tried it many years ago because all the dermatologists were raving about it and mm-hmm. I didn't like the smell. It, it had kind of a stinky smell yeah. and like if anybody comes near you to kiss you don't want them to smell like a stinky yeah. smell on your skin so I just said no I mean I don't care how good it is I and I was I still use retin-a and renova at uh-huh. night uh-huh. and uh-huh. that was like the big thing no smell looks does a great job that's one of those things that's supposed to build collagen uh-huh. so and then I used a bunch of other things anyway eventually they had the more advanced serums and my it was at my dermatologist's office and I said does it still smell and she said no oh good and so I bought it and oh my god it's the best stuff seriously I mean I've spent money on other products this one is actually completely worth it so I I would do you put cream on over it or just on its own i use no I that's like after I only use it in the day and sometimes every other night because it uh, every night I generally use the Retin A and the Renova. Oh, uh, but um, yeah. it's well, like right after you cleanse your skin and tone it, then you you use that. And then I I like um, Revive. I for years I've used Revive's oil free moisturizer. Um, it's been my favorite. I can't replace it with anything. There's nothing as good as that. And you that's day and night. I'm writing this down. No, <laughs> that's um, day because it's got SPF in it. Okay, with okay, with us. So first I'll do the TNS after cleansing, then I'll do the um the Revive. The Revive, okay. Oil free. And they were reformulating it. I they better not wreck that formula. 
this was my last, this is my last bottle of the, um, the moisturizer, the classic oil-free moisturizer of Revive. So I'm, and where do I'm, I get, I, where can I get, where can everybody? Neiman, Saks, okay. you know, I think Nordstrom's, it's okay. online as well. Okay. Um, what do you use around your eyes? Your beautiful Play, big eyes. Play, Play de Peau. Play de Peau makes the best eye cream. Because sometimes they sting. This you, one does not. You know, I, I'm allergic to everything in the universe unfortunately. And this one is great. I don't use it at night because I can't have anything get in my eyes, but they're the clay de peau. Um, I don't know what it's called. Super advanced eye cream or whatever is, is, is a good, so far, that's the only one that I really love. And I bought repeatedly. Okay, cool. Yeah. Good to know. All right. So moving right along now, tell us as much as you can about the film project that you have coming up. Well, I'm you know, this close to our financing completely in for this movie that I um, wrote. It was, it, yeah, it's, it's a long road to pull Always together. You know, um, there are things that fell into place incredibly effortlessly. For mm -hmm. example, attaching the, the director that I like love the most, except for Robert Wise, um, which is Bruce Beresford. Oh, nice. Um, it, I adore Bruce. I've loved every movie he's made. I think he's genius. And I think he's a super underrated genius. Yeah, he's brilliant. Yeah. And he is the loveliest, most unpretentious, wonderful. He's a wonderful man. Anyway, I didn't know how wonderful a man he was before this, but I knew he was a brilliant director. And um, we Did were- you take the project to him? Yes, we, we were working on attaching a director. And by we, I'm also including my husband, who's a film producer. Mm -hmm. I wrote this movie and I wrote it a number of years ago. I wrote the, the screenplay a number of years ago and rewrote it a bunch of times. Um, What's it about? It is, it's about three young women who become friends in Paris like college age? Amer or? American yeah. women, um, Emily, just after, after college. Emily in not, Paris? Nothing okay. like it. Nothing like Emily in Paris. Okay. okay. I love Emily in Paris, but okay. it is nothing like Emily. Okay. In Paris. Okay. okay. It, it's, um, it's a drama and it's based on, on ex my experiences actually when I lived in Paris. Oh. I lived in Paris for two years. Uh -huh. I went there when I was 24. Mm -hmm. And um, I became friends with. I mean, of course, the incredible experience of living in Paris is like none other. Yeah, I mean, for those of us who have fantasies of what France was like and Paris and that whole expat experience, it was everything and more. Um, but I became friends with these two other American girls who were living there. And, you know, each of us had been attracted for different reasons. E each of us wanted something else in our fantasy of Paris. And, and one of them made some choices that were really tragic ultimately. Mm -hmm. And it, it really consumed me over time. She and I were friends for quite a long time. And while, when I had quiet time, I just said, I, I have to just write this. And I'd written little short stories and, various things before nothing of this magnitude I said I think I'm just gonna write a screenplay about it and I did and then I put it aside for a long time because Eric needed me my that's my son and I really couldn't devote what I needed to do to get it from point a to point b and then I rewrote it as I got better at writing as and we do. as we do and then eventually Jeff read it and said it's wonderful. And he yeah, actually, there's, there's more to this story, but it's a long story. So I'm going to just cut to the chase here. So he said, we, I think we need to work on attaching a director to this. Uh -huh. So we, nothing came immediately to mind. There was a movie called Mr. Church mm -hmm. and I had had one of my Academy screeners. It was with Eddie Murphy. It's with Eddie Murphy. Mm -hmm. It was a 
based on a memoir, which I read later. Mm -hmm. And it was so beautiful and so touching and so amazing. And of course I was in a puddle by the end of the movie, just weeping at many points and, you know, beautiful, sensitive, very nuanced. Mm -hmm. And after, as I was wiping my tears at the end of the movie and the credits went on, I'm like, whoever it was that directed this movie, that's the person I want to direct 20 Boulevard Saint-Germain or Boulevard or however we're going to call it, but it's 20 Boulevard Saint-Germain. Mm -hmm. That's the title for now. And um, it was Bruce Beresford. And that was the director of that wonderful movie. And so based on that, you know, we got in contact and he said, I love your screenplay. It's oh. the, my favorite screenplay. I, my favorite line he had when we were working on our notes a little bit later, tweaking a few things was in a screenplay filled with superb dialogue. This may well be my favorite line. And I was like, oh. I have died and gone to heaven. Wow. It is the best thing. So being the fan wow. that I am of Bruce is. And, you know, we met up with him in Paris and did location scouting. And, you know, we have a wonderful, everybody, we have a wonderful team. We have wonderful actresses that loved it. We are probably going to be having Catherine Deneuve playing this one role. Oh, nice. And um, Vincent Perez is um, going to be playing the role of Georges and loves nice. that character. And so... It's, it all fell into place except for the financing part of it. And then that came and it went and it came and it went and, and now it's coming. It, it, yeah. Now it's, so we were told that we may well be able to start pre-production in June. Oh, cute. And, and so, so yeah, it's a yay. Um, and it's, it's exciting because I did really want this story to be told. It's a little bit of a cautionary tale mm -hmm. and, you know, um, but it's also basically an incredible um, celebration of Paris and love and beauty and, and youth and the idea, the, the, you know, how much as super young women, we idealize things and, and that makes us vulnerable, but it's beautiful too. Well, that's, you know, that's what makes it so special. That's what's, that's what people want to see, especially nowadays, you know, I mean, it's been a dark time. It, it's it been a horribly been. dark you know, time. I was going to ask you about that, about with the sound of music being based on a true story and with all of that's going on in the current uh, political Eastern European situation with Ukraine and Russia. And, and how do you now view the sound of music and its theme of escaping the Nazis? Uh, it, you know what? It's been many, many years that I have viewed sound of music. I mean, it, obviously not as a child. Right. Although even as a child, we, one of our, um, one of our little trips that we took, cause we used to, when it rained as it did so often, our tutor, this wonderful woman named Jean Siemens would take us on field trips mm -hmm. and there was a ton to see, um, real life history, you know, all around us, Mozart's birthplace, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But she took us to Hitler's Eagle's nest. And I remember, which is where he committed suicide. I remember feeling such a sense of oppressiveness, such a darkness. Yeah. And I'd never heard the word suicide before. I obviously, you know, heard that word that day and learned it. Um, that was the, you know, little by little, right. It kind of trickled in what it was like, what, what I, what that movie was actually about. Mm -hmm you know, past the surreal aspects of, of childhood filming and everything. I mean, the, the Nazis were played by extras. So mm -hmm. I, on all our night shoots doing the, the filming in the concert hall, I learned, I played gin rummy with men dressed in Nazi uniforms. I have like this weird. weird, like yeah, <laughs> it's a weird so thing. Weird. And they were yeah. just like, they were extras dressed in Nazi uniforms, yeah. but you know, I obviously knew right away that was a super bad thing. They, that what it represented was bad, but you know, as time went on, you know, and I learned more and more history, it just was. And then I learned a lot of history about the Von Trapps themselves and how incredibly brave and courageous they were, all of them, you know, and how remarkable Georg Von Trapp was, Ca Captain Von Trapp. Mm -hmm. You know, he, Hitler had asked him, asked them because they were well known as singers 
at the time. Mm -hmm. Hitler had asked if they would sing at his birthday party. And obviously, Captain Von Trapp and the family said no. Yeah. He'd asked for him to be not what it was in the movie, but some sort of military advisor. He said no. And the eldest child was someone named Rupert, not Liesel. He was mm -hmm. a doctor. He mm -hmm. was asked to take over the hospital in Vienna, who's the position that had been vacated by a Jewish doctor. And he, he said no. So friends of the Von Trapps apparently said to them, you can't keep saying no to Hitler and be okay. And that's when he talked to the whole family and everyone agreed that they would leave whatever the cost was. And the cost was huge. They left everything behind. Oh, yeah. They ended up, you know, eventually on a, on a boat with, you know, to America mm -hmm. with like $13 or $30 or some minuscule, you know, amount of money on them. They, they took shelter with the Catholic league, rescued them for a while mm -hmm. until they started singing again. And one of the reasons they became in this country famous for their wearing their Austrian clothing is because they didn't have any other clothing. Yeah. So, so, and so there's all of that. And of course, you know, the more I knew about their actual history, the more in awe and respectful I was of everything that they went through and achieved. And it's not that far from home for me because my Great grandmother was a refugee from what used to be the Greek part of Turkey when when Greeks and and uh, Armenians lived peacefully with everybody for many hundreds of years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but when the Turks were busy killing all the Christians mm -hmm. and the Greeks and the Armenians who were Christian, etc. She had to flee and she fled with her five children wow. by boat to wow. go to Lesbos, uh -huh. where, uh, where ironically, all the le uh, so many refugees are coming through now and have been. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and she had to start life again with all her children. So among them was my grandmother. Amazing. And so it's not that far from home, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. it's, it's not, I, I, you know, it's, it's, I see them and I, I, I feel it in my bones, yeah. all of it. Yeah, of course. Of course. You know, one of the things I'm proudest of is just a little thing. It has nothing to do with me specifically, but my great grandmother, who obviously was incredibly, that was my maternal great grandmother was obviously mm -hmm. incredibly tough woman. Her husband had died. She had to save her kids. She started all over again. The Nazis occupied, um, occupied Lesbos. Um, I, when, when the Nazis were occupying, they also occupied Greece. And my, one of my great aunts had thought who lived in France had thought that her little baby would be safer. Her little boy would be safer in Greece that the Nazis wouldn't come there, but they did anyway. So she brought her son to my great grandmother to take care of. And oh, then the wow. Nazis were also there too. Uh -huh. So I guess he was very sickly and she wanted to take him to the thermal baths that were there and uh -huh. they were guarded by Nazis uh -huh. and they wouldn't let her go through. And she said, but I have to take care of my, my grandchild. And I don't know what he said to her. And she slapped him. Wow. So I have a great grandmother who slapped a Nazi and lived to tell the tale. Wow. It wow. was actually her grandson my my cousin who told the tale he was like i was holding her hand there are the nazis with their guns and you know because she was such a i guess lovely person his superior well, after he took the gun and kind of aimed it at her you know stopped him from shooting them both wow but um what a tale it's a tale you know wow. and and yeah i i look at let me tell you one thing I am the fastest person to get out in a, in a, in a state of emergency. Mm -hmm. I will gather up everybody I love and get them out of the house. The minute there's a fire, any kind of an itch, uh, when we had that fire a few years ago, right. we were out. Yeah. It yeah. was coming close. We were gone. I got my nephew at the dog. I got, you know, I mean, every, my yeah. son, yeah. all the stuff we needed, we were out. 
I'm I I feel that in my in my in my bones. In I'm sure it's some um, yeah, blood. it's it's there. Mm -hmm. So I you know, I can't believe what's happening now. I can't believe it's happening. I can't believe we see it the way we can see it, the way we would have seen World War II if, you know, somebody had made that point. I thought it was brilliant that because of our cameras, because of our accessibility to all of that immediately, we can see massacres. We can see all of the horrors and hear about them. And obviously in a way that's a good thing so we can see it and nothing is hidden and but it's certainly makes it all the more and horrific and that we can't help that we can see it and that yeah. we are the only thing we can do is send money or collect clothes or do right. whatever or or right. if you're some courageous man without a family or whatever you go and help them or or woman or doctor or whatever right. but those of us who can't just sit here and you know i don't know yeah. offer money and and see about collecting things yeah it's it's tough i mean it, and i'm sure that there's some von traps that are dealing you know that are there that i'm are, sure that are making their escape you know um, oh no no doubt no doubt no doubt about it you know there was a new story um about the little special needs group one little group of a school that had been um, sent to a different place. I think they were in Poland. And I mean, you know, the teachers had gone with them. Mm -hmm. Their teachers had left with them, which I think was just Admirable so remarkable beyond. because they didn't want the children to also have those adaptations to do, those adjustments to make with strangers. Of so course. as a team, Wow. they came That's so that so that this you know kids already dealing with so much wouldn't be that much more dis disturbed mm -hmm. and one of the boys who was one of the boys who was verbal limited but verbal mm -hmm. was asked were you afraid you know that the reporter did a great job were you afraid you know and he said well i didn't like the noises you know and they chit chatted with him. He said he has his teachers, his friends, he's, he's doing okay. And they said, what do you want to be when you, do, do you know what you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be an American. You know, I mean, yeah, I know. God almighty, you know, yeah. I mean, so much suffering and, and uh, old people, young people, strong people, weak people, sick people, disabled people, mothers in maternity hospitals, having just given birth. Yeah. it's it's just it's it's got to stop oh absolutely i mean absolutely there's just it's it's, it's just something that uh, horrors of which i did, don't think any of us were prepared for growing up after no. world war ii i think we had you know we were the hills are alive with the sound of music you know what i mean it's like we thought this was all behind us we thought this was over and that this kind of evil had been annihilated but but no but no, of course not. And I Our, will say that like every other woman that I know, I am in love with Zelensky. My husband knows yeah, it. Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, crush. He, is, he is really something. Yes, he is. Really he is. amazing. I mean, All of went, those people. He went from a comedian to leading this country with the utmost of, of determination and guts and all the stuff that's needed to do what so he's much doing. courage so much bravery oh. so much software you know so much like yes. ability to stay calm and you know anyway i yeah so yes. I, yes. I, I love i love Zelensky. mad crush we have mad yeah. crushes on him i know me too um i remember when i was what was i 23 uh, and I went to the German, I was living in Munich at the time, and I went to the German Austrian border where that opening shot with Julie Andrews is done for the sound of music. And I remember I said to my companion, I have to get out of the car. And I got, I got out of the car because it looked exactly like it does in the movie. And I got out of the car and I started singing. 
you know, the hills are alive with the sound of music. I could not help myself and spinning around like she did. And you I mean, did. I, That's so cute. I did. That's adorable. It was yeah. spring too. And I was just like, this is just too perfect. I walk yeah. onto a movie set, except that it's real. You know, it was just one of my favorite memories. It always will be, always will be. Every time I see the film, I just, I get chills and I start to cry. And I'm like, that was me, except course i wasn't in the well, it, it, it was me there. and we both went to marlboro so exactly it was and you know let's face it kim out of everything you've done in your life your greatest claim to fame is that you went to marlboro school for girls following in my footsteps that's so, there you go you know i mean i just was thrilled though to find out we were both you know yeah. yeah yeah well i could talk forever but i know that you have to get going i do so thanks so much for coming on the show. And I hope you had as much fun as I did. I had, of course I did. You know how it's much lovely, I adore lovely, you. It's lovely, lovely, lovely to talk to you. You know how much I adore you. Thank you. It's mutual. Big kiss. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Love Bye. you, honey. I'll Bye, talk baby. to you soon. Talk to Bye. you real soon. Bye, honey. Bye. Well, there you go. That's the end of our show. And once again, I hope you enjoyed today's show with Kim Carath. And as always, love and light, stay in your power, and peace out. Bye, y'all.